Le 4 avril dernier, quelques heures avant l'ouverture de la grande exposition sur l'art de James Cameron à la Cinémathèque française, on a eu la chance de se balader avec lui au milieu de toutes ses œuvres. L'occasion de revenir en 5 pièces sur toute sa carrière. Science fiction can make money. I wanted to talk about the, the drawing that you had in your childhood. Like, why did you draw that much and what did it mean for you? So I think everybody gets the reference point here, which is Ray Harryhausen, Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, the famous, you know, sort of Cyclops uh, dragon fight. And this is just my version of that. You know, we, we didn't have VCRs. Um, so I couldn't pause it. It just was on TV and I remembered it. And then I drew this in response. So obviously I loved, I loved fantasy. I loved adventure. Uh, Harryhausen was incredible. You know, long before CG, he was creating creatures that were impossible, impossible with makeup. And yet they, at that time at least, were very compellingly real looking. There was nothing else like his work, hmm. you know, uh, on the landscape. And I used to love every Ray Harryhausen film. The second they came out, I'd go see them in the cinema if I could beg or cajole my parents or my grandparents to take me to the movies. And so what he did with his work was he brought to life ideas that normally you could just read. Mm. In a, in a, you know, in, I, I read every, I read every bit of science fiction. I read some fantasy, not so much, but, um, but I loved anything fantastic. So that, I mean, I, without realizing it, I was already setting my path toward mm. doing something artistically in the realm of the fantastic. And let me give you an, another example. So, uh, when I saw uh, Mysterious Island, I was so excited by that film. I was in the third grade. And I ran home and started drawing my own version of Mysterious Island. Mine was completely different. They're on a raft, their ship sinks, they wash up on the island, there are dinosaurs. Okay. I mean, it wasn't the same story at all. But the, but the excitement, the, the provocation came from that particular movie. So I think I was already doing two things that were healthy. One is I was taking in and I immediately felt compelled to create. The other thing that I was doing was Even though I was a huge fan, I wasn't slavishly being a fan to that movie. Mm. It was inciting me to create my own independent story because I felt well, I've got a story I could tell, you know. And I think those are two things. I think it's hopefully this exhibit space can inspire young artists, filmmakers, writers, whatever, to first of all be inspired and secondly find their own voice not just emulate what other people are doing. Maybe we can go to another room. Okay. The Travis version with the Terminator. All right, so we're in a section on the Terminator, obviously. This, I think I did this as a, a sketch for a, a movie that some of my friends were working on at Roger Corman, uh, Roger Corman's yeah. facility, which I had already sort of graduated from, but I wasn't making any money, <laughs> so I had some free time. And they wanted some design art for a film called Android. Well, what's an Android? It means human-like, synthetic person, right? So this is obviously the famous uh, Vitruvian Man, uh, you know, of uh, Leonardo. And uh, so I just did half and half, the exterior being looking completely human and the interior being completely engineered, synthetic, robotic, right? So that gets us to the Terminator pretty mm. quickly. So the Terminator came along... I don't know if this is dated, but I'm guessing this was 82. 81? So, um, it is, say 81? Yeah, maybe yeah, 80, 81. 81, yeah. So the Terminator was going to come along in about mm -hmm. another year, that idea. But I was already thinking about it at this point. I was already thinking about a, a human simulation, an infiltrator, appears normal from the outside. And I thought, look, I, I've done a lot of work with prosthetics and rubber and puppet, puppeted, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, prosthetic characters. Rubber never looks real, but what if in the future they had the technology to, through genetic engineering, they could actually create a living exterior? So mm -hmm. what I was talking about was a cyborg, right? A cybernetic organism, part biological, part robotic. 
And a lot of people just think of Terminator as a robot, but he's not. He's a cyborg. Mm. So he has this organic exterior, as uh, Michael Bean's character says, s- you know, sweat, bad breath, everything. <laughs> Theoretically, such a, uh, an organism could pass for human, but you've got a, a, uh, an artificial intelligence mind. So there's two AIs mm. in Terminator. There's Skynet, which you only hear about, mm. the kind of AI overlord, super intelligence. But the Terminator is an AI. He's a, he's a mobile AI. And I think there's a fundamental difference. I think as we go forward and we deal with, with AI, especially AGI, meaning mm. our artificial general intelligence, something that has an ego, something that that is essentially a conscious organism. You'll have the distributed form that's in some kind of big server farm, right? But the second you give it mobility and you bound it to Mm. a body and you create an embodied AI, it starts to live by our rules of mortality because if it's not distributed, it can be destroyed. Mm. And the second an AI confronts its own mortality, it's going to become a lot like us, maybe for the good and maybe for the bad. You know, that is yet to play out. I wanted to talk about the gen- like xenogenesis a little bit. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Just show me which one. I wanted to talk about um, some of your hard work. Yeah. Because it's one of the first time that one of your work was, sub- uh, your drawing was supposed to become work, concrete yeah. films. It didn't happen, but it kind of happened. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but, but um, so I, I went into an extremely creative phase around trying to make a science fiction movie. I quit my job. I was working as a truck driver. Mm. I quit my job. I started working on it full time. We had a little bit of money from from a company that wanted to do some kind of science fiction movie. They didn't know what. The Star Wars had just come out, yeah. made all the money in the world, and every, the light bulb went on all over Hollywood and all over yeah. the world. Oh, science fiction can make money, right? And it was the point at which, you know, you had the 50s and the 60s and the early 70s. Science fiction was dystopian. It was bad futures. It was apocalyptic. It was all the things that can go wrong. Star Wars was about adventure. It was aspirational. You wanted to be in that, you wanted to be in that movie. And that was the first time, really, that that, mm. that had happened. So it was a whole new world. And I was poised with all of the books that I had read and all the ideas. You can see all the ideas around the exhibit. I was ready to go. So I just went off like a bomb. And I started just painting and drawing all these scenarios. You can see elements here, like, like this guy became the Banshee, you know, the mm. Akron, in Avatar. Exactly. I mean... You know, this is much more of a a manta-like creature. We eventually wound up with something more pterodactyl-like, but we kept the idea of the jaws that open like Mm. that, the teeth that fold in and come out, that's right there. I also gave that idea to Stan Winston, we were on a plane, plane riding together, and he says, I gotta design this predator. I said, have its teeth go like that. <laughs> and he said, oh, I like that. And he, and he drew it up. That's where the predator came from. So, you know, I only have a few ideas. I just keep recycling them over and over. And this is a kind of mashup of the whole xenogenesis story. You know, he gets a synthetic arm. He becomes a cyborg. It's a love story. You know, the, the spacecraft with the, with the bright, you know, antimatter, engine uh the blue girl this was 1977 i painted this or 78 maybe right this saved us a lot of money when we got sued by 11 different people on (laughs) on avatar that they had had the idea first they said no i did this in 1977 they all went away right but here's another interesting one this machine this uh, big robotic machine on treads morphed later into the the, the uh, uh, hunter killer mm. machine in the Terminator, right? So that got that wound up in Terminator. That wound up in Avatar. The the blue and and purple and magenta planet wound up in Avatar. You know, cyborg stuff just everywhere. You know, <laughs> uh, this guy. You know, uh, some of these yeah. ideas will actually emerge in Avatar three and Avatar four. Okay. Right, so okay. a little bit of a, not a spoiler, maybe a teaser, Teasing. right? <laughs> and obviously this guy got used yeah. in a, in in a very seconds. morphed form in, in Avatar. I've never done the zero-G lovemaking scene. That, Soon? 
could show up at some <laughs> point. This is all, you know, sort of going around a black hole. But you can see a lot of elements in this this painting right here. Is this okay for you guys? Yeah. So here's a a, a starship that that's its engine section is running so hot that it actually glows and it mm. has these bright radiators and it's putting out so much energy from its uh, antimatter engines, right, that it just kind of lights up for miles behind it. We used a lot of those ideas in the, in the uh, ISV, the interstellar vehicle okay. for Avatar. In the first Avatar, we see it with its engine shut down, but it's glowing red. Yeah. So I'm just challenging the audience, well, what do you think that is, you know? Well, it's been burning so hot for so long that the entire thing is heated up. Um, in Avatar 2, we actually show that. We show that long plume of, yeah. of antimatter propulsion, and then it shuts off. And you can see that it's glowing, you know, from the, from the heat. I just wanted to express the kind of energies that it would really take to travel between star systems. It's something we can barely imagine right now. We don't have much time. I just want, I need a few minutes on a last yeah, sure, piece. Sure, sure. If I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't know that it was yours drawing at first. Most people don't. I mean, I didn't make a big deal uh, out of it, you know, when the film came out because I wanted them to think that, you know, Jack was really the artist, you know. But and, you did every drawing that Jack did yeah, in the Jack's movie. Yeah, Jack's whole portfolio, or most of it, is in here. There are a few in a museum in Perth right now, but eventually we'll get them all back together. But yeah, the one of, of Rose obviously was the most important one, because that's the plot, the, the one that you actually see drawn mm. on camera. Um, so Kate posed uh, for me as a photo shoot in, uh, I think, a bikini, right? So I had to use my imagination. <laughs> and you can see there's some different poses that we experimented with here. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to see her hands. I wanted there to be to be beauty and, and, and character and expressiveness in her hands. I didn't want it to just be about her, her naked body, you mm. know, because I wanted Jack to see past that to the essence of her. And I wanted the drawing to, to reflect that, right? She had beautiful hands, you see. I think you must have had a love affair with her. No, 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 no. Just with her hands. But that's crazy to see the difference between uh, drawings of, uh, uh, spatial uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, vessels, and then just the humanity, the, the pure humanity of of well. Ones. And I think his portfolio, if we look at some of the other the other drawings from his uh, from his sketchbook, you know, what is Jack interested in? People. This old guy, you know, it looks like he got him to stand there for two minutes and sketched him quickly. Um, a mother nursing a baby while dressed in Edwardian wardrobe, that mm. would have been a very strange thing in those days. Maybe, maybe in a bohemian area of Paris, not so strange at that time, but still pretty strange <laughs> yeah. culturally. Hands. So I looked at all my old notebooks, and I was drawing people that I'd see in class or outside in the park and that sort of thing, and just put it all on the same page, you know, because he didn't have any money, so paper would have been expensive. You know, so he, he'd put several drawings, you know, he, he loves this guy's hand, so he does a separate drawing of the hand. You can see he's fascinated by hands, by expression. Uh, here he's just drawing some dancers, you know, uh, nude, which was not a big deal for artists at mm. that, at that time. Certainly not in, in Paris, I wouldn't have thought. And then in the story, in the, in the dialogue, there's the, the one-legged prostitute. Mm. And you see Kate Winslet react to the drawing, but you never actually see the drawing. Yeah. I mean, I think the drawing is okay, but the image in your mind is better than the drawing, <laughs> right? So we, we chose not to show it in the edit, although I did, I did create it. But I was trying to create a character for Jack mm. by what he saw. Even if the audience doesn't see the details of the images. Exactly. They, they go by quite quickly, yeah. you know, but it suggests something about him, that there's a sensitivity to him, that there's an empathy to him. I wanted it to be more than just he, he saw a girl that he thought was attractive yeah. and said or did anything to win her heart. It's more like he's a naturally open and empathetic person. And when she sees she sees into his mind through his art, I think maybe when I was you know, 19, I wanted somebody to see me <laughs> through my art. Never happened, by the way. <laughs> Never happened. But, you know, you can fantasize. Wait, can we just talk a little bit about Avatar? Uh, there is the, the sure. drawing that is the poster Absolutely. of the exhibition. Yeah. 
we hadn't cast Zoe Saldana yet. Yeah. And uh, but I knew that the design of Neytiri was going to be the keystone for all of the not be characters, because the question was how human do we want to be, how alien. Do we want to be? Yeah. And we had a lot of designs coming in. We had Wayne Barlow working with us, who's done some amazing artwork about extraterrestrial creatures and, and ecosystems. They kept coming back so alien that I didn't feel an empathetic connection. So I tried to do, I did this drawing to just give the art department uh, a, a kind of an inspiration that I wanted her to be a person that we wanted to know. So very large eyes we respond to. You see it in, in manga. You know, uh, in, the, in the Japanese art um, and uh, anime. So large eyes, cat-like eyes. I decided not to do an elliptical pupil like a cat because that felt too Difference. obvious, even though we were doing cat-like ears. And so, you know, the face opened up. The idea of these kind of um, uh, camouflage markings like a, like a cat or like a, uh, uh, maybe a, a large cat, like a jaguar or an ocelot, something, something like that. But the actual, the source for this was a, was a photograph that was in the LA Times as part of the promotion for The New World. There's a young actress named Koryanka Kilcher who played Pocahontas in, in The New World. So this is actually her, her lower face. She had, she had a very interesting, oh. interesting face. And uh, I wound up meeting her years later and I gave her a signed print of this. This is actually the original. I gave her a signed print of it, which she has up over her fireplace, because not Crazy. that she was the inspiration for the character, but I just wanted to show how a specific person's mm. look could come through in the, in the character. And that was important, because then the second we cast Zoe, we started, you know, Neytiri suddenly looked like Zoe. So, you. you know, it was the question is, how did we get to that, that point? Perfect. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Colmini! Colmini!